Hey, aloha, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of Security Matters. We are not live from the studio today. We are live from the Security Next Conference in uh, New Orleans. Uh, it's been a great show. Uh, the folks here loaned me a room to do the show, and I'm excited today to not have, have it, not having have to skip a show. Uh, we have Joe Rakow in the studio with us, or not in the studio, but remote with us today. And uh, he is from Fortia Partners. He's a partner there. And uh, Joe, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you joining me here for a double remote episode. Uh, it's my first time doing one of these, so we should have some fun today. Yep, we're trying out the technology. Nice, thanks, man. Um, I um, I typically like, um, in case our viewers aren't familiar with your work, um, uh, we know you, you know from your work with PSA previously, but um, if you could give them some background, uh, maybe some of your history led up to some of the work you've done with Fortium Partners and the work that brings us here today. Today, we're going to get into some of the cyber hardening, cybersecurity around facility management uh, a little bit later in the episode. But let's get an intro from you, sir, and uh, thanks again for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been in uh, in the software development uh, industry for a long time. I've done about, about 40 commercially successful applications. Did it in the period where they were just starting to become networked and found that uh, that security, as the internet came, the, the security became a very big issue. And so I started the electronic crime and risk management practice for the, uh, uh, I guess, the predecessor of Fortium Partners. And at that time, it was a, a senior executive advisory uh, about uh, cybersecurity not really being a technical issue for senior management, but more of a business issue of reputation and um, uh, its stock value, and and that that was really where the the the, the pain was going to come for businesses, because the unique thing about cybersecurity is that people can steal your data, but you still have it. It just gets into the possession of somebody that shouldn't have it, and so you now get a question of. Uh, you know, about the level of attention and competence and negligence that might have been, um, you know, uh, applied to this, uh, to the data. So uh, then I, recently I had a security systems integrator, integration company. And at the time that we were providing physical security, we, when I acquired this company, I discovered that we were also increasing the cybersecurity. And so we quickly went and developed what we called the cybersecurity protocol that we used. And it was about 60 security controls that we used whenever we installed or serviced systems uh, for our customers. And uh, and then that's moved now into what we call the Never Cry Cyber Defense with Fortium Partners. And it's a much bigger um, uh, service offering than it was when I was just doing it with my own uh, integration company. And that's how I got here. <laughs> Are the, um, what, did you, um, most, you know, I know there's different types of controls and most of them, you know, map back and forth from this to CSF, ISACA, uh, Australia 25, and there's all, all these different frameworks. Did um, how do you folks decide on the 60 you decide upon? That's of real interest to me because many, you know, the, the CSC top 20s out there. Um, what, where, did, where did you, where did they evolve from? Uh, what was the driver there? That's a great question. Well, there are all these standards. There's CSC, there's ISO 271, there's uh, about seven or eight NIST ones. So what we did is we looked at what are the common ones across all of them. And the theory was that if they're common to everyone, then everyone has to have them. And if everyone has to have them, we don't even have to do a, an assessment to find out. We just go and start to do it. And if we see that's it's already there, it's fine. If we don't, then it, we don't have to do it. And um, it saves both time and money in terms of you don't have to do the assessment first. And while we're implementing those 40 to 60, we, um, we find out what is there. We actually are conducting an unofficial assessment and we can find, if we find really big gaping holes at that time, uh, we can, uh, you know, we'd get them addressed. And so then when the assessment's actually done, it's pretty clean and somebody doesn't get a whole bunch of bad news. 
The other thing That's is, is we, um, out of that common set of, four, of say, 60, uh, depending on the system you sell and the market you serve, that you're going to have a slightly different set. So that's where it becomes maybe 40 for some people and 50 for others. Um, if you're ser uh, selling uh, AV systems, audiovisual conference room collaboration systems to the office market, it's probably going to be about 40 controls. But if you're doing access control in a, in a laboratory that has very sensitive information, it's going to probably be up there pretty high. Make sense? Nice. I like I like yeah I like the idea that the, the approach is a takes into assessment the risk of the not only the material being handled or the you know the asset being protected but the system type that's being used. I think that's forgotten a lot by people that want to apply you know he, they walk in with heavy duty you know NIST 853 1700 controls. Oh my gosh, if you're not doing all this, it can't be secure. And that's just not the case. The case is really building a, a protection level that addresses the risk that the, that the customer has. Because then, then when it's palatable, you know, to the budget, to the to the implementation, you know, methodology, it's probably can be affordably maintained. Uh, we've all gone in and know that, you know, hardening is a point in time, right? We've got to somehow right. monitor that hardening condition to make sure some guy like me doesn't accidentally hit the wrong keys and, you know, change something that, you know, I didn't mean to change. There's the, the negligent and the uh, haphazard operator, I'll call them, you know, for, for, for lack of a better word. There's the mischievous operator that just wants to go in and try things because he thinks he knows what he's doing, then leaves things um, unsecure. So that uh, that piece of it, I think, is so important. Um, has Was your experience with this, the 60 or so controls, um, was that fairly easy to monitor and maintain for the clients? Well, the beauty of them are, is when you look at them, they're really simple. And if you're already there doing it, it just, it's something that just, it's like, um, this is what we do. It's like brushing your teeth and combing your hair and, uh, you know, it's just what you do. So some examples are how long does it take to turn off anonymous access to the application? Not long if you're, once you're configuring the system, but that's a major deal because now that enables, um, you know, logs, the uh, activity. So now you can track what happened uh, to a system. Um, doesn't take uh, long to uh, change the default password. And if you in, in, and if you check in advance with the customer and you ask them what's the convention for their passwords, then you um, you just made it that much better for the customer and you've secured the device. Um, I mean, those things are really, really simple. It really adds less than you know, uh, a percent of the um, of the time on a project. It's not a cost factor. Yeah. Yeah, we like to build those hardened conditions in the lab, right? Obviously, in the pre pre in the pre staging of a system, sure. uh, what we call phase testing, and we're burning in to make sure the devices. You know, usually if they're going to go bad, they'll go bad out of the box in 24 hours or so. Right. So you know, we get past all that, we get a hardened configuration, then we get it dropped into the facility, then we get to run a check against it to make sure nothing's been changed, and then you know we have a sort of a, a point in time place that we can send a technician back in to periodically check if we're not running some. Uh, you know, persistent monitoring. Not all the sites are allow persistent monitoring or want to pay for it. So at least we've got a baseline image that we can at least check that periodically to know if the customer's made changes of his own or somehow the device has been compromised or whatever. So I think it's super, I think it's super intelligent to build a system that meets the needs of the customer, adds a lot of controls that probably many, many people haven't considered doing. And so was this something that you kept internal? Was it something that you shared out to the community as a, hey, here's some best practices that we've adopted? Um, or was it like a competitive advantage type of tool for your group? Well, no, we, uh, we uh, I did presentations at PSA Tech uh, more than once. You know, it's, it's, the, um, it's, it's a very useful way, very pragmatic for everybody because it doesn't add a lot of cost. For example, with the, uh, 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 the scenario you just described, when that system's installed, one of the items on almost every cybersecurity hygiene is uh, synchronize that system with the network clock. So that now all the logs will be able to, uh, will be synchronized so that you can compare what happened on this system at this time and what happened on another system at another time. If that's not, um, you do a real disservice to the security team if that's not um, synchronized. But how long did it take? Uh, no, it's just a piece of everything. 
you just point out the NTP device. That's a normal setting on a checklist, right? I mean, everyone has this. It's I've I've, I've been in situations where that where the NTP was not turned on for anything. So I understand exactly what you're saying. It's a nightmare to understand what occurred after the fact. Um, let's um let's let's compare and contrast just for a moment. You know the the security world that we were talking about, the AV system world, and then I know you've been recently working a lot more in, with building and facility systems, and these are different probably not IP network systems or sometimes a blend of IP and devices that aren't on the network at all. Um, and I want to get into the, the, the never crash system. We'll, we've got a break coming up here in a couple of minutes, but give us an, uh, give us an idea of what, how you switch from sort of the integration market into this, um, the never crash, or, or are you still doing this for those folks as well? Yeah, I call this. So let's see, I call the systems that are uh, the building IOT or building systems, the junior varsity of building systems. Awesome. And it's okay. the, the voice over IP phone system, the access control, video surveillance, the business machines like the copiers and the printers, um, AV conference room equipment, and the non-engineered HVAC systems. Once you get into the engineered ones, you're into real building automation. Um, the reason that we focus on the junior varsity of the building systems is because uh, they're the point of attack. Uh, the Harvard Business Review and Microsoft uh, Signals, their research group, that's two research reports came out in 2019 that said 60% of all cyber attacks start with the junior varsity of building systems. Of course, that's my... Uh, paraphrasing there. Um, and Microsoft identified the top three points of entry. Um, now this is 1400 companies uh, uh, that they studied that were attacked by nation state attackers. And out of those 1400, the top three was, uh, the first one was voice over IP phone system. The second was, was video surveillance, uh, actually the, uh, the network video recorder. And the third one were the office machines that were connected. Um, Interesting, yeah. And so All of it go, connected on the planet. Yeah, so if you go to, the, to that first graphic that we have, number one. Okay. So this shows how um, uh, the point of attack is on these building systems. The, the attackers uh, um, get their point of entry, then they sit there with a software implant and they pick up the credentials of people who log into those systems, assuming that some of those uh, administrators with those privileged credentials uh, have uh, access to other uh, systems as an administrator. So that gives them the power to move outside of these uh, building systems and go and attack the data, either uh, for ransom purposes or to steal it. Or, or it attacks the uh, the industrial control systems or the engineered uh, building automation systems. And the interesting point for the listeners, I think here is that on the, on the IT side, if they go after that, they're going after pure data. If they go into the building systems area, now you're getting into an area of uh, life and safety. Uh, there are a lot of attacks that have happened um, um, to demonstrate the ability of uh, taking over a building, stopping elevators with people in it, um, um, destroying centrifuges that are uh, producing, uh, you know, either scientific or, or weapon grade materials. Um, there is no security without securing the junior varsity of building systems. Yeah, and I like your caption there, overlooked and undersecured. Hey, we're about midpoint, so we're going to take a break for a minute, pay some bills. Uh, we'll be right back in one minute with Joe Rakow. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Being a lawyer has many aspects, and I try to cover them every time I do a program of Law Across the Sea. Not everything has to do with law or being a lawyer per se. Some of it has to do with the people you meet, things you see, places you visit. And that's what I try to combine in Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Thank you for watching. Aloha. 
Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of Crossroads in Learning on ThinkTech Hawaii. On Crossroads in Learning, our guests and I discuss all aspects of education here in Hawaii and throughout the country. You can join us for stimulating conversations to enrich, enliven, and educate. We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Security Matters. I'm with Joel Rakow, and we are talking about Never Cry. Joel, take us into, um, I guess, the next slide. Let's talk about that chasm that exists back there, and then uh, walk us through some of these um, the reparations that you've got. I think you've got a few slides for us. Yeah, I do. This is fun stuff. Okay, so what we have here is what we call the Backdoor Canyon. And it's IT department is on one side of the canyon and the building systems and IC are on the other. And uh, so we talked about how you can't secure your buildings or your IT, I mean, you can't secure your IT data or your buildings uh, without, um, uh, 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 without securing the building systems. And um, the reason for that is that building systems have been designed in a way that um, they can't be communicated with by IT's standard everyday tool for monitoring what's the version of the firmware on the, on the system, uh, uh, who's logging in, who, are the, who, are, who has access, um, preventing people from having access, updating the, uh, the firmware, uh, what's going on uh, with the memory on these devices, they can't see it. And so they can't help. And so the people, um, uh, facilities, management, and the supplier of building systems have to be the ones that uh, secure the device, at, certainly at the device level when they install it. But that was almost impossible to do until 2019. Several really, really terrific things happened in 2019 that now make it possible. Um, you want to go to slide four? Yeah, let's have good news. That's awesome. Good news from yeah, 2019. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes, that's right. These things all um, power things um, in a way that just couldn't happen before. Some of it is awareness and some of it is actual software tools and technology. So we want to go to slide four. Okay, so... So what happened in, um, um, in early in uh, around June of 2019 was first we understood that more, that a majority of attacks were coming through the building systems and both Microsoft and Harvard um, uh, Business Review reported that and made that public with solid research and of course um, you know high profile credentials. Then NIST came out with guidance on how to handle um, IoT systems, devices. Now, some of these are building IoT and some of them are just other IoT. But what they said that made it so important and, and, and empowering in some ways is they said, we can't give you a standard. Um, these devices have so many things that require special consideration and manual configuration that we just, um, you know, we can't tell you what to do. We can't say do this. All we can say is you got to consider this and you got to configure if you got systems with these um, parameters, you've got to configure, uh, got to configure this. Um, so that sets off a whole different thing when people can't just lean on a framework that's already provided for them. So um, the idea of the never cry cyber defense for building systems, so you've got building systems that are the majority causing the majority of the, of the, um, um, the presence by unauthorized people. And you know that you have to figure out in the kind of, in the, um, in the situation, what controls need to be applied. And um, so that's the service of the never cry. 
is that NeverCry has gone through the 60 controls that every cybersecurity framework requires and gets all the ones that are required by those and then applies the considerations that NIST identified to say, well, if you sell a voice over IP phone system in, a, um, in an office environment, then these are the security controls you um, probably ought to get pretty good at installing for, with your systems. Um, and if you do uh, video surveillance in a um, like a football stadium, then these are probably things you ought to be looking at. So we do the configurations and provide the guidance um, and uh, train the technicians so that they know how to do it, train the salespeople to help them um, avoid getting into conversations about cybersecurity because all they have to do is know their hygiene. And so the customers say, well, what do you do in this situation? Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, this is what we do every time. We go through and we do this and we do this and we do this. And um, the salesperson and, um, can uh, feel confident that, um, that it, it, they're not losing control of the conversation and they're giving valid information. The really exciting yes. stuff. You don't want them to get creative with their, get creative with the, uh, I think we're doing that. Let me get back to you. That's never good, right? You right. really want a nice, solid That's answer when really you're talking good. about hygiene. It's our hygiene. You can count on it. It's like, you know, I, uh, I wash my hands. <laughs> uh, Perfect. Okay. So that's securing, that's the first layer of security. Remember that everybody talked about having multiple layers of security. You can't just have one. So that's the first layer at the device level. And what's unique here is that it's the supplier who knows the cameras, knows the encoders that are used, knows um, the, you know, the, 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 the manufacturers that are at various stages of updating their firmware. And, um, and they're the people that have to do it at the device layer. You can't expect IT to do it. You can't expect the, the um, facilities management staff to do it. Um, it has to be done by the building suppliers. Um, and the, the end user in, uh, you know, has every right to expect that. And so it's a nice handshake there. Um, okay. But what really happened in 2019 that, um, uh, was the next layer of security, and that's the network layer. Remember, these devices do not interoperate with standard IT um, tools and technology. So we need to do some special things in order to um, uh, be able to secure them on a network. And one of the really nice um, things is um, a software-defined network technology is available where you can go and identify all of the devices, all the, the junior varsity building system devices that are on your network, and you can identify them um, by their addresses and then um, create a fight. And then that be can become a firewall so that the only way that they can get, that those devices can be accessed is through whatever ports you're creating with your software defined network, which is typically only one, and then you manage that port, and now you've got two layers of really good security. Okay. Wow. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. there's a little bit of overhead with the software defined network that um, is a kind of like a total cost of ownership issue that a lot of companies that, if they're pretty, you know, they look at it in detail they're, and uh, the finance group gets involved, uh, they'll say maybe that's not the best solution. Then there's the software defined perimeter which is a, um, a really, really slick um, uh, solution that uh, cloaks the identity portion of the IP address so that an unauthorized person can't even see that that device exists. And of course, there's an encryption process there. And so people who have the key can see that device. And the beauty of that technology is that um, you can move devices on and off the network and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to report back to anybody. So that it eliminates that total cost of ownership. Then the, the third thing with this that is really important for IoT devices is um, sensors. If you think about it, almost every IoT device is essentially a sensor. Um, who presented their card at the door? Um, 
who walked in the door and or, you know in the hallway and there's a, a video surveillance uh, who's talking to me on the on their line of the telephone they're all sensors and there's very it's very difficult to control uh, when the sensor itself is compromised and that the signals that are going into the sensor are the same signal that's coming out um, it, 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 managed and adapted according to whatever protocols are in there. So there's a comparison. There's a device out there that will compare the signal in, make the adjustment for whatever protocols and processes are done inside that sensor and confirm that the, uh, that the signal coming out has integrity and is the right signal. And uh, that's a really, really like important setting, part. Yeah, it's like setting a signal parity. So I love this. We've got software defined network. We've got a software defined perimeter, and then we've got like device parity going on inside this uh, inside this building. Uh, that's a lot of security that people don't hear about. I'm glad you, you've taken this this uh, sort of a, a rescue net out to the people in the world. So because it, it's uh, it's never too late for them to start getting better. Um, All right, right. We're just about we're about at the end of our time. Um, uh, would you like to add a, a final comment for our, for our audience out there that may be watching, um, maybe how to get a hold of you? Well, um, yeah, so you can get, um, get a hold of me through Fortium Partners. Um, so it's fortiumpartners.com. But I do want to mention that facility managers now have the opportunity to um, um, retain um, technical uh, leadership to help them um, assume the responsibility and and, um, and execute well with the uh, the security responsibilities of their devices, especially since now they really can't rely on IT to help them. That's uh, probably a, a pretty important message, I think. And you yeah, were talking about really that earlier. It. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, thank you for joining us today. Facility managers, get a hold of 40 and partners and get yourself some help. Uh, that's all we got this week for you. We'll be back next week on Security Matters. Thanks again for joining us. Aloha, Joel. Aloha, audience. Aloha. <laughs>